Thank you very much. My name is Adrian Travis. I'm an associate professor at the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies at University of Wisconsin in Madison. And the Nelson Institute and I are very honored and feel privileged to have been invited to organize the scientific portion of this conference program, which will be in two parts. Uh, the scientific part of this program will be in two parts. If you're having, having trouble hearing me in the back, please move forward. There's plenty of open seats. So the scientific program will be in two parts, the first of which is starting now with my uh, introductory comments. Thank you. And we'll end right before lunch. And the second part is on day two. Uh, now, the reason that the Nelson Institute um, and, and I were chosen or invited for this task is because of our focus on interdisciplinary environmental studies. Um, and I myself am trained as a predator-prey behavioral ecologist, then moved on to study human dimensions, um, and most recently looking at issues of public policy and law that relate to biodiversity, wildlife conservation, et cetera. And it's with the comments that I'm about to make, I'm gonna try to keep it short since we're running behind a little bit, are to introduce why do we want a section on science in a conference that's dealing heavily with the public trust? And part of the answer to that question was addressed by our keynote speaker, Mr. Rowledge, for which I'm very grateful. But I also want to point out that the North American model of wildlife conservation has gaps. Those gaps became obvious in the 20th century as large carnivores were increase, increasingly scarce and eradicated, some to the point of near extinction in the US. So there is another story that has not been told. It's been told even less than the story of the North American model of wildlife conservation. And that's the story of the public trust doctrine. And the public trust doctrine for the US in particular, I'm gonna do a concise history of it in order to explain the role of science in the public trust. And this is necessarily going to be very quick. I'll elaborate on it in my second talk uh, when that comes later. So starting with the American Revolution that made um, US citizens sovereign when George Washington crossed the Delaware and in some key battles kicked the mercenaries, butts of the British army, the Hessians. Actually, they were mercenaries. And George Washington and his ragtag bunch kicked their butts, and out of New Jersey, we saw the beginning of the end of British domination, and the domination of the then sovereign King George III. And after that point, the US citizens became sovereign over all lands and waters and resources. In an 1842 Supreme Court decision, that uh, Darrell referred to, Martin V. Waddell, the Supreme Court of the US established that all of those environmental resources and assets belong to all of us. And then in a series of decisions, 1892, 1896, 1948, the shape of that public trust or wildlife trust became more and more clear through more and more Supreme Court decisions. There was a hiatus, there was a, a sort of a blank spot in the tape until 1970 when a judge and legal scholar, Joseph Sachs, reinvigorated the public trust doctrine. I'll talk about that at more length, but the modern view of the public trust doctrine can be stated as follows, and it owes much to the writings of Judge Sachs, who said that democratic US governments must be accountable to the broad public interest for the preservation of wildlife and for the regulation um, of exploitation and uses as a trust asset for the benefit of current and future generations. And subsequent to his reviving, revitalizing, reinvigorating the public trust in jurisprudence for the US, a number of states took up public trust cases and began to clarify the contours of the public trust and establish it more clearly, uh, notably New Jersey and California, 
the states were early adopters. This modern view of the public trust doctrine has split, spread around the world, thanks in large part to the writings of Judge Sachs and to the rulings of US courts. Now more than 21 countries have some form of a public trust doctrine, and uh, at least 44 states make explicit mention of trust duties. <clears throat> so there's some common mis misconceptions about the US public trust. One of them is the word doctrine. It doesn't refer to brainwashing. A legal doctrine is, is a guiding principle to help decisions made in courts. And uh, it's based on constitutional, statutory, and case law precedents. Right, so it's doctrine in the sense of guiding judges how to decide issues that relate to environmental trust assets. Um, another misconception uh, that I wanna set to rest is the use of the word preservation, which does not mean no use in the legal sense. Um, all legal uses of environmental assets are, re are recognized. Okay, now Judge Sachs was uh, particularly concerned with a theme about information sharing and transparency and careful and sophisticated measurements uh, made by the government when it allocated environmental assets. And this is resonating with Daryl's talk, our keynote speaker's uh, call for evidence-based policy. Judge Sachs made this extremely eloquently uh, this statement about the importance of avoiding ventures into the unknown. Um, I won't read it for the interest of time here, but this is starting to point at why science is so incredibly important in the full articulation of the public trust doctrine around the world and in the U.S. and in the proper accounting for our environmental assets by the government as our trustee. And so very quickly, we have, a pro, uh, we have a section in this conference on science and the public trust because we need to understand the uses of wildlife. It's an asset, a trust that we're passing on as a legacy to future generations. And just as with charitable trusts, there's an important need to account for the uses, make sure they don't impair the trust, deplete the uh, principle of that trust, that it keeps producing benefits for future generations. And that accounting requires both social sciences and ecological sciences and other forms of scholarly inquiry so that we understand who's using the asset, how is it sustainable. That's almost always the realm of social science, but certainly in collaboration with ecological scientists. And for the status of the asset, we need the ecological scientists, especially uh, when we're talking about wildlife that are notoriously difficult to count um, and account for and understand the behavior of. Um, so as the, as the, I introduce the next speakers, I'll be thinking of some questions for them. I'm very interested in the tribal perspective on trust responsibilities whether the U.S. public trust doctrine resonates for them. And um, I'm not going to take any more of your time, but I want to now introduce our next speakers who are themselves scientists.